Good morning, I'm John Riley. I'm here on behalf of Northampton Community Television and Massachusetts Center for the Bar in our continuing series of visiting libraries here in the Connecticut Valley. Our mission is to visit as many as we possibly can and find out what they have that's special, that's different, that sets them apart from all the other libraries. And we're very lucky living here in Western Massachusetts to have so many libraries. Every little hill town, every city has libraries. And they all have something special. And today, we're at the Holyoke Public Library with Eileen Crosby in the archives and in the special collections. And she's going to show us some of the history of the city and some of the history of the library. And we're really lucky here today. We have the room to ourselves, and we're going to get to see some great stuff. Eileen, um, can you tell us just a little bit about the history of the library? It's a beautiful building, and you have this whole new edition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We saw some of it in the introduction to the right. video. Uh, when was the library built? The library was founded in 1870. It wasn't at this location. They didn't have their own building. But it was uh, founded, actually, the, the person who initiated it was a 29-year-old mm. um, uh, entrepreneur and who founded one of Holyoke's uh, most successful paper companies, William Whiting. And he uh, gathered together some um, really progressive thinking men in Holyoke, mostly men, um, to contribute to the founding of a library. It's very um, impressive of a 29-year-old. <laughs> yeah. It was. And he called it uh, the People's College? I think it wasn't called that until later. Okay. So what happened was that at first it was a, it, you had to pay dues to use the library, a dollar okay. a year. And then around 1885, 1886, they lifted that. And circulation and use of the library just uh, grew phenomenally. And so by 1895, they really wanted their own building and began to, to raise money for that. Holyoke Water Power, which I'll talk about a little bit more mm -hmm. in a minute, which owned much of the real estate in Holyoke in the second half of the 19th century, um, donated the land and the park adjacent to the library now to these, this library corporation if they could raise enough money in three years to build the library that they wanted. And they succeeded. Those were boom times for Holyoke. It was they really were, quite strong. They were, yeah. and, and, and I, I want to tell you more about that. Um, but the library, uh, just to talk about the building a little bit, mm -hmm. um, the architect was James Clough, who was a local architect who donated his services. Uh, there were major donations. It was a major donation from J.P. Morgan, whose family had roots in, in this area. And so the whole library cost about $95,000 to build at the time. Um, and they used local builders and, and some imported materials like um, the limestone and brick. Um, it's a beautiful facade. It's really very impressive. The, the old facade yeah. is, yes. Um, yeah, we should with, mention with, that with you, the Greek columns. you have a new library <laughs> right, we have built into facades. the old library. <laughs> two right, facades. Right. So it was built in 1902. And I think that's when it became dubbed the, the People's College. Uh -huh. And that is also when the, when the stacks became open to the public. So you could go in and browse for books. And that was, it was fairly new for libraries at the time, to, to let the public in. And as we were talking about before, you had the famous glass floors that uh, mm -hmm. let light in. And Forbes Library in Northampton has it too, and they were right. very revolutionary at the time. To, we had a this cast iron and, yeah. and glass stack wing. Yes, it let in light. Well, you'd have let a lot of natural light in now too. Your you your, your addition is just beautiful. It's like I don't think you need a light bulb in there. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Um, very airy. Well, you know, everyone is is really pleased with yeah. the renovation. Yeah. Um, so they expanded the library. The the renovation. The, the groundbreaking renovation began in 2011. Of course, the work, the preparatory work, the, the grant, the fundraising, yeah. that all went on for years prior to that. Yeah. And we opened at this location in 2000, October 2013. It's a really great addition to the city, uh, giving the center of the city this great renovation. It's really a beautiful building. Well, let's see what you have in store for us. What have you got in okay, well, Part of the core collection here <clears throat> is certainly that original library collection. Um, we have some earlier histories of Holyoke. Um, we have uh, subject files, <clears throat> excuse me, 
that were created by those uh, by librarians in the early 20th century, books from the late 19th century. So those have belonged to the library. At one point, they were gathered into um, a historical collection of sorts. But the history room is actually really a, a recent uh, development. In the early 90s, a man named Paul Graves, who I think was a volunteer at the time, with a really strong interest in Holyoke history and very knowledgeable um, about Holyoke's history, wanted to pull this together as a, as, with a reading room and with services for people, and, and did that uh, with the library's blessing. Is it and very busy? Is it uh, frequented a lot during your open hours? It is. Okay. It is. So we, we have probably over 100 patrons or inco remote inquiries a month. Yeah. Um, but Paul Graves really built up the collection. I hear about him almost every week. Mm -hmm. um, is he still so with he's us? well remembered. I, I believe he is. Okay. I haven't met him. Um, but around 2000, I think, um, he must have retired, and then the library began to. Well, they made they made a commitment to keeping this room staffed and open at least 20 hours a week. And it's really great because I, there, it's just so much history in Hollywood. So much went on here. It's, it's really great that, that you are maintaining it. Are you following all the archival practices of air and temperature? We're, we're, and we're trying else? to. You're trying, we're, yeah. we're trying to. We it's do hard have in the a, winter. Yes. We have a separate stack collection, a compact shelving wow. area that is separately controlled. Okay. We do have our own thermostats in here. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in the summer, I think that the, uh, the heat and humidity tend to overtake yeah. um, the system a little bit. So we actually brought in um, some portable dehumidifiers, yeah. and that's been working really well. That's really important. Um, we do have a state-of-the-art fire suppression system here, mm -hmm. which it's um, it's not the kind that sucks all the air out of the room, which is dangerous for humans. Okay. But, but it does <laughs> replace. I've never even heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> it does replace, I believe, 7% of the oxygen in the room with another gas, which is not flammable. So you can breathe at least enough to exit yeah. uh, calmly, and it will suppress all fire. So that's in this room, in oh, the room behind without us. Without foam or, or anything. Right, without, without anything destructive. I've never heard right, of it's such a thing. Right, it's just a gas. It's really great. Is that and a modern this, invention? It in is. Really, yes, yeah. it is. It's, it's the latest technology. Uh -huh. I'll look into that. Well, one of the things that uh, libraries are finding, and history is finding, is that the longest lasting method of recording history is paper. Uh, digital things mm -hmm. are degrading much more quickly than people mm -hmm. thought. It's, it's hard to refresh that information. And paper uh, is good for hundreds of years. So right. if you, if you right. treat it right, it's right. going to be here. High quality paper. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> High cotton thread content. Yes. So, and, and, and Holyoke was a, I'm jumping a little bit ahead of the story here, but um, Holyoke was the place to get your paper. Yeah, um, we all know it as the paper city and mm -hmm. the paper city brewery, and right. it's the moniker right. for Holyoke. Right. Yeah. So if we back up a little bit, Holyoke is very unusual for this part of the state in that it was a planned industrial city. It was originally, it was farmland, and it was farmland up until almost 1850. Yeah, that is unusual. It wasn't didn't have that colonial history going Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It was part of Springfield and then part of West Springfield mm -hmm. from the late eighteenth century. And it was called the third parish of West Springfield or Ireland Parish, mm -hmm. which many people associate with the later waves of Irish immigration, which which really marked Holyoke. Um, but there's not they're not connected. So okay. it was Ireland it was Parish way back in the yeah. early eighteenth early nineteenth century. Mm -hmm. Um, and probably named after a, a, an Irish settler, uh, a farmer. Yeah, might have been a surname Ireland or something. Yeah. Right. Well, we, it, it seems to be traced to this farmer Riley. Um, mm -hmm. But that's it, it, obviously a little bit hard to document. Um, so in, 18, in the 1840s, a group of Boston investors were very interested in, in finding a new place to invest their money. They wanted to build an industrial city in western Massachusetts along the Connecticut, similar to Lowell, the same idea. Mm -hmm. And they were thinking of textile manufacturing city. And they surveyed up and down the Connecticut River, and there were a number of candidates. And Holyoke, because there is a natural 60-foot drop in the river right out here at the bend, um, they were, it was the ideal place to build a dam 
to, to capture that water power, a dam and a canal system. And, and that's what they did. Um, was it producing electricity back then, or was it actually It was actually power water power. It was actual water power, so turning wheels, tur wheels turning. and turbines. Interesting. Um, yeah. And then later it became more electric. Yes, exactly. Um, and but but still using using the water. And it was ideally situated also for the log runs from New Hampshire mm -hmm. and Vermont. Uh, living in Northampton, I've seen lots of pictures, and they went up until the fifties, I think 1957 was the last log run on the Connecticut River. So in the okay. spring, when you had the floods, you would bring all of these logs down. Mm -hmm. from, you know, as I say, New Hampshire, Vermont, was just this mm -hmm. conduit. They would store them all winter. They'd cut trees all winter, okay. put them in the river, and bring them down here okay. to make paper. Mm -hmm. So very epic uh, journeys with, mm -hmm. with all that wood. It's hard to imagine you know, how to pull that off. It is. <laughs> but but that, that, that's, you know, that's how you could have, you know, the paper. Uh, you had the wood, you had the power, you mm -hmm. had the water, you had everything here. Mm -hmm. to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get one item because this will... help uh, illustrate the early history of Holyoke. This is a report by those investors that was published in 1853, and it shows... Well, that's amazing that you have this. <laughs> It it's survived all these years. And this is their plan for uh -huh. Holyoke. So the city is all laid out in a grid form. The canals are all drawn in there, although it took until 1893 to complete them. Um, these, this is the, the waterfalls there. Where is the library in this? Uh, the drawing? library is right, right there. I think in the it's middle. right there. <laughs> well, that was good planning. Yeah, that's great. Look, it actually just, might it might be over here a little bit. Somebody just sat down with a grid and said, "Hey, let's <laughs> let's make this city." Yeah, yeah. It's, were, it, it is really interesting just how modern how it is. Well, they um, they did have to rebuild the first dam. It washed away in a few hours. <laughs> but they started in rebuilding it in a few hours. It was a wooden dam. <laughs> oh um, so the the next one was reinforced with stone. They actually rebuilt it in seven months. Okay. And it and it held. Um, it had to be reinforced in later decades and then was replaced with a stone dam, which I have a diagram of. I've um, seen that. Uh, it's just a beautiful dam. And there's another library on the other side. The South yes, Falls yes, Library, yes. just on the other side. With a nice <laughs> view of that dam. Um, so what happened was that this original company uh, formed a corporation that went around buying up land from the farmers mm -hmm. and building mills and then getting... Um, tenants for those mills. So the first mill they built was a cotton mill. So it's mill. kind of speculative. Just, mm -hmm. so let's build this and see mm -hmm. who will come. Mm -hmm. and, and this is really a prospectus. This To, to it, sell it. Right, right. In 1853 there wasn't that much industry in Holyoke, but they that you are... have this before, it's almost before the history of the city. <laughs> I mean, this is the, the Ten Commandments. Right, right. And we have digitized that and put it into um, I don't know if it's in Digital Commonwealth yet, but it will be. And I think it's in the Internet Archive. That's great. So, now, uh, uh, talking about digitization, it's not a distraction. Mm -hmm. How much of your archives have you digitized? And do you plan on digitizing the whole thing? We What's... really just got started in the mm -hmm. last year or so. Okay. And we have digitized a number of books. Like we, we kind of cherry-picked the books to... to digitize first those with the most illustrations and mm -hmm. with founding documents like this right. and, and and other books that were just packed with information. Um, so we probably have probably fewer than 20 books. Who but, does your digitizing? But we also oh, um, digitized over 500 photographs. Okay. And we're creating descriptions for those now. We're going to so look at some of those be, today. We're going to, we are going to look at some of those. And we're, we're participating in the Digital Commonwealth program. What is the Digital Commonwealth program? I'm not familiar well, with that. Well, I'm not the best spokesperson for it, but it is a, um, it's a collaboration between Digital Commonwealth, which is an online repository for mm -hmm. cultural heritage materials nice. um, that are in Massachusetts repositories. And so collaboration between them and the digitization lab at the Boston Public Library. Yeah, they do a lot. BPL is just amazing at their collections. Right. They really have a mission to go out and find 
documents uh, to digitize and, mm -hmm. and books and, mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. And it's free. I've been on their website, and it's just amazing. Right. The books look like really can turn the pages. And it's it's, it's very high quality yeah. work, and and they're, they're wonderful to work with. Now, do they actually do the digitizing for you? They do you do. send them the book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Or I think there is provision where people already have digitized material. Yeah. They can integrate it into. I think that's such a great idea. I mean, uh, not only does it preserve that information, but it spreads it out, uh, and things have a better chance of surviving because they're digitized mm -hmm. and because they're spread out. I mean, other mm -hmm. libraries will, will maybe store some of that information right. or pick up on right. it. So. Right. And our main reason for, for participating too is is access. Our other main reason. Uh -huh is to to make sure these we're a public library and we want these materials to be accessible to the public. Do you have any kind of stats on how many hits you get? Uh, no, I, I, we don't have that much up there yet, okay. but I think we probably will be able yeah. to get Well, maybe after our film, we'll, we'll start getting more hits. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, need to, we'll need to rush and get our description stuff. Okay. Um, so, Parsons' paper was okay. established, I think, um, Joseph Parsons was from Northampton. That's Sue right there. I don't okay. know if your camera can see him. Maybe I, I caught him. Okay. The room. Yeah. So he established Parsons' paper in 1853 and began operation. And by the um, by 1869, there were 11 paper mills operating mm -hmm. in Holyoke. Um, and they so, were all cooperating, I guess. I mean, just to have them all in one city, so concentrated, it's just amazing. And they must have had some level of cooperation, not just always competing. Well, I think the demand for paper, for different kinds of paper, was, was very so high. So huge, that, yeah. Parsons Enough for everybody, yeah. It, that may have been the case, but I've been wondering that myself, because I have seen that uh, someone who was a... The, the president of this company, or the, the, the treasurer at this paper company, would, was the president of that company at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, I think there was there was enough business <laughs> to yeah. go around so that so that multiple companies could could profit, and and those numbers kept going up, and, and Holyoke could, got more and more of the share, the market share, of of um, paper manufacture in the country. Um, so Parsons paper operated well into the 20th century. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, what is interesting in New England, I guess it's probably true in the whole United States, is how one city would have one particular specialty. You know, in, in Connecticut, you had a city that was the Brass City or Whip City mm -hmm. in Westfield, or you know, Akron was a Rubber City. And, uh, uh, but once you had a, a certain core of businesses, it would attract others and. You know, I can see how Holy we can just pretty much paper. I'm sure they manufactured other things here too. There must have been other things going on. They did. There were but, but there you, were cotton mills. Okay. There were woolen mills that were very successful. Uh, the Farrell Packer Mill, at its peak, uh, employed 4,000 people. Wow. Um, and I haven't that. told you about population. Holyoke, when it was when it was still a, a farming uh, mm -hmm. village, really had a little over 3,000 people in this area around 1850. Mm -hmm. And by, um, I'm just going to look at these notes so I don't have the number wrong. So by 1875, it was 16,000 people. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was. Um, and then all the way up to into the 1920s, there were 60,000 people in Holyoke. It peaked around and it's then. It's about 40,000. So, Right. So, it, but it, it the the population increased tenfold, really, in in the late nineteenth century, yeah. through through immigration and and uh, reproduction. And and it, that's how it became such an Irish famous as an Irish city because so many of them were Irish immigrants. It, 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 it did. It was perfectly although, timed for right. you know, the Irish famine and. The, you had a million new people coming here. Right. Yeah. Right. Desperate for work. Yeah. Right. Irish laborers were worked on on the dam and the canals. Yeah. And and then later, as that immigration continued, um, in the mills, men and women, children in the mills. But then there were many other immigrant groups that came to Holyoke. There were uh, French, Polish, German, Italian, mm -hmm. um, and and then smaller numbers Greek, Russian. Yeah. 
and so it was. Uh, well, it's it was very, very Latina. Though. It's very sort of Latina yes. city. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The the population of Holyoke is almost fifty percent mm-hmm. Latino, and a large proportion of that is is Puerto Rican. Are you documenting uh, those changes? Are you trying to? We are keep trying up? to. I, you know, I know you say you look at the past. Mm-hmm. How do you collect <laughs> for the future when you focused on the past? Well, it's it, it's interesting that you ask because we just got a grant that the his, history room and the library initiated uh, a national endowment for the, for the humanities grant called the Common Heritage Grant, mm-hmm. and it's specifically for outreach to communities to collect family history materials. Mm. Our grant is focused on Latinos in Puerto Rico. And so we'll be getting that off the ground this spring and summer. And it will just be, we hope, will be a first step because the Latino population in Holyoke is really under-documented in, in our repositories. It would be interesting to trace the history of why it was attractive, how they moved to Holyoke. Right, and right, so I think that would right, be interesting. Right. And I think this project assumes that every family has a story, so yeah. that every story is going to be a little bit different. Sure. And, and so what, we, the, what the grant supports are scanning days where people, we have a, a portable scanners out at a location in the community, oh, cool. people can come in and get their material really scanned, small amounts of material yeah. scanned, they get their originals back, they get a digital copy, maybe on a USB drive. We also have them sign off so that we keep digital copies and those go into our digital collections. And of course, along the way, we collect information about, we can incorporate oral history into that. Yeah, yeah. I bet you're getting some great recipes, some great music. Well, we uh, haven't started. We just got the grant. We just got got the grant. But it's very unusual. I've I've never heard of of that. You've really got some unusual things here. (laughs) Well, let's take a look at some of these uh, documents and pictures. Right, right. And I can tell you a little bit. Boxes. A little bit more about the history of Holyoke along the way. Great. I mean, you have so many uh, interesting things here. What, what are we going to start with? Well, because the Holyoke Water Power Company was the, the company that, that bought the land on which this industrial city was built, they, they, owned, they owned land underneath the mills, and they owned the land underneath a lot of the houses that you see out in these neighborhoods. Uh, this log book, and full of diagrams here, is how they were using that property in the 1870s and developing that property. This so, looks like a handwritten document. It is. These are drawings of homes they were building, land that they were dividing and, and selling off for development. Um, Whose uh, logbook was this? This is the Holyoke Water Power Company's mm-hmm. logbook. And it's so unusual that you have this. I mean, you really have the. Uh, the original documents. I guess that comes with being a more modern <laughs> city. You, you get to have this stuff. Um, so they, they made money for their investors by, by charging rent to, um, to industrial enterprises, leasing mills, by selling mills to companies, and by charging them for the water power that they were using. But because they own so much land around Holyoke, they also got into to, essentially to real estate development. It was a and good investment was on a, their part, no, wasn't he, it? Yeah. As that population grew, um, there was a huge demand for housing. And, and as people became more wealthy, and you'll see some evidence of this too, there was a demand on one end for, for higher end housing, for, for these beautiful, there are beautiful sing family beautiful homes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and there was indeed a building boom at all levels. Uh, there, were, there was a building boom with regard to apartment building and the small row houses, but also um, the builders were very busy building the big Queen Anne's mm-hmm. and, and the beautiful stick style houses that you see in Holyoke today. So yeah, I was really delighted to find this, um, which as I said is, is a book of diagrams of the planning of, of developing. Yeah. some of that real estate. That's a really valuable historical document. Have you digitized this one? We haven't. We haven't. It's got some nice color illustrations that make it mm-hmm. interesting just as a document. This is and a great bit... handwriting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And we have many patrons who are interested in the history of their homes and history of their neighborhoods. So this, uh, especially if we get it digitized, could be a valuable resource for them. That's great. It became uh, a center for technical innovation as well, particularly with regard to water power and, and the development of, of turbines. Um, So these were, this is an illustration, this is actually from the Holyoke Machine Company, which started in Holyoke. At this point, when this was printed, they were in, uh, headquartered in Worcester. But this is an illustration of the, the Hercules turbine water wheel, which was developed in Holyoke by John McCormick. Um, and Holyoke became very well known for the efficiency of the turbines developed here and also for water wheel testing. They, uh, Clemens Herschel, who was a well-known engineer, he worked for the Holyoke Water Power Company for a number of years, built a testing flume and water wheels were shipped from all over the country to be tested at Holyoke and, and then priced and sold based on the results of those tests. It was a very powerful river, as you said. Right, right, and being, able to, capture, being able to capture, because, because mill owners at that point are paying for the amount of water they use, being able to capture the most power possible out of, out of the water that you're being charged for was important. So I don't, this is probably not a unique item, but I think it's a pretty rare it's item. No, I mean, that, I mean, that's a really interesting uh, part of the history because it's also tied together, the, the water, the land, the power, it's all one. Um, that's what these investors were, were, were trying to capture was everything, uh, the water, the power, the, the land, and, uh, and charging rent, and charging for using the water, and charging for the electricity. It was a brilliant concept for an investor. Mm -hmm. So we do have some trade publications, um, but that wasn't really what I wanted to show you. What I want to show you is this payroll ledger from Parsons Paper. It starts in 1861. It's a beautiful report. Now ledgers, you may know, only give you a little bit of information. Um, I don't know if I can read this upside down. So is this like the pay scale and the Well, these are, these are individual employees, and it shows how much they worked, what they're getting paid. Um, here, I think it's per day. So then the total amount that they're paid, and their signature. You can see that some of the handwriting is is not schooled. We have a, a trade publication that I think is really interesting because it's so detailed about the paper mills here. It's a, it's a weekly that just talks about machinery and the business, and uh, you know they, they could support a weekly paper just talking about their paper business. I find that really interesting. There was a trade journal published in Holyoke called the Paper World which we do not have the originals of, but we have the bulk of it in photocopy, which is, uh, has even more about the local paper industry and how that was connected. And that to was published this. here. That was published mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, a great resource for people mm -hmm. interested in paper. And this really fits into our documentation of the book arts in the Valley, because you can't have a book without paper. So this is really important stuff. Okay, we're back from the climate-controlled compact shelving area where many other of these valuable archives and documents are stored, and we brought back some special things. What have we got? Yes, we have a sample book from the Parsons Paper Company. This is from around 1900. I think it's actually combines. Oh, there's a there's Parsons Mill at its height. Um, you can see um, the best equipped mill in the world. 
for bond, linen, and ledger paper. That exclusively. Is huge. Just a huge place. Oh, God. So they made very high quality, uh, high rag content, or high linen content, cotton and linen content papers. And this is their sample book with just gorgeous illustrations. And this is actual Parsons paper. So they were aware even then that uh having rags and, and things mixed in with your paper was, was a good idea rather than just Oh, pulp. well aware. A absolutely. Yes. And and every every paper company would have <clears throat> would have a laboratory and would have skilled chemists uh, working developing the techniques uh, for for high quality paper making or for whatever they wanted to produce. It's a nice sample. Yeah. And we do occasionally get inquiries. Someone is trying to, to date a piece of correspondence mm -hmm. and wants to compare the watermark or date a piece of ephemera, wants to compare yes. the watermarks that we see here with the watermark on the item that they have. I think <clears throat> for paper companies, I mean, it was, it was what we call now branding, right? Um, to, to make sure that their papers were identifiable as, as theirs, That's as their product. And now you have something you know, that we're talking about paper, and I see another thing over there about yes. paper making. Yes. But I, I love it, and, and if we were to, to do an exhibit, which one of my predecessors did on, on paper making, this would be one of the centerpieces, or the centerpiece, I think, of the exhibit, which shows the, the entire root of the paper making process here. This would be something that would be worth uh, reproducing and make a poster out of. Yes, yes, it would. And this is from American Writing Paper, as you can see, which um, bought up several of the, many of the paper companies, I should say, in Holyoke uh, by the early 20th century had consolidated. So Holyoke's paper industry was comprised not only of paper makers, but of, of companies called paper converters. So they were making things made of paper. They were making uh, ledgers, they were making um, uh, notepads, they were making um, greeting cards. And White and Wyckoff became a, a specialist in stationery and greeting cards. And we're lucky enough to have several of their company photo albums from the early 20th century, which shows not only um, the principles in the company and some of the offices, but the, what was happening in the various workrooms. And this, John, we were talking about gloves earlier. This is where I would normally wear gloves, but I forgot to put them on, so I'm gonna to try to hold this by the edges. Yeah, you mentioned only <laughs> use the gloves with photographs. With photographs, correct. And some of their displays. So I find that in our photograph well, collection- the actual making, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. And the fact that these, these photographs are actually labeled, they're captioned, is very helpful. Our photograph tends to be, photograph collection tends to be strong in outdoor images, so images of buildings and streets, but interior photographs can yeah, be very hard was, to come by. You know, it's just, people go like, why would you take pictures of people working? Mm. Like, who's, who cares? It's right. Like, but now, that's like some of the most interesting stuff to right. us. Right. Yeah. And, and White and Wyckoff, appears to have produced one of these on a regular basis, one of these books. And I'm not sure of the purpose, whether they um, gave them out to, to prospective uh, buyers or um, if they were gifts, but they're great documentation. So this is more, this is, um, these are, this is the press room, this is, embossing presses. So that's a great resource and we have several of these. So labor intensive, you think making papers, you just throw it in a machine and it comes to the other <laughs> end. There's so much human interaction, it's amazing. Right, right, and so much specialization within the company. Mm -hmm. uh, people had specific 
specific jobs that they were that they were experts at. So here are some of the photographs. Uh, some of these are the ones that you exhibited at the Morgan during the uh, exhibit about the, the library and its reconstruction. Yes, that was what I highlighted in that exhibit were the photographs of Milan P. Warner. He was born in Granby and worked in the Holyoke area uh, primarily in the 1880s and 1890s. And he called himself a landscape photographer. We ended up acquiring in the 1950s over 300 of his original glass plates, glass plate negatives. They're very large, they're 10 by 12 inch negatives, most of them very thin. And I think he called himself a landscape photographer. You can see you're zooming in right there on the interior of a paper company. Um, because he didn't have a studio. He went out and about to take his photographs. And I think you just zoomed in on a couple of gorgeous photographs of the dam. And he is responsible for leaving us this, this incredible documentation of uh, Holyoke really, Homes, yeah. uh, Mills, the center photograph there of the man in what looks like a big a big pipe is one of the penstocks that that carried probably carried water between the canals and the turbines we were talking about earlier turbine would be down in one of these penstocks and the rushing water would, would turn it what years was he taking these pictures so we think that none of these are dated but we've been able to date them roughly and we think they were all taken between 1885 and the late 1890s. He died in 1903. Yeah, you would have to call him like a really early industrial photographer, someone that was really kind of reflective. Like you say, landscape, everybody's out taking pictures of cows standing mm -hmm. in the pasture, but mm -hmm. to actually show workers and, and factors is just really a revelation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can zoom in on any of these, but also these, we think that he did some of these pictures of homes uh, on spec. Um, and often the homeowner is posed with what was probably a brand new home at this time. You can tell by the size of the trees that mm -hmm. it's recently constructed yeah. house. And there are dozens of these as well, of, of families and sometimes neighbors uh, all posed together outside their homes. This is a beautiful home on Pearl Street. A beautiful now, what stick was style. the photographer's name again? Milan P. Warner. Was he from Holyoke? He was from, originally from Granby. But he uh, did, okay, you said that. He did, right. he did right. work and live in Holyoke. He also, uh, I think he lived in Springfield for a time, so we do have a number of photographs of Springfield. And this, you can tell that these prints look very modern because they are. This yeah, is. It's like Steichen or something, yeah. Right, we do have the original glass plates, but. The library got a grant in the 1980s to have contact prints made of these. And so these are the contact prints so done with, with 1980s technology. They really and are works of art. They're beautiful, yeah. yeah. And, and this is what I had on exhibit at, at the war again. Um, I mean, it's a great collection because we do have the original glass plates and now we've had almost all these prints digitized as well. So these can be taken off site and displayed. Are these in the uh, Commonwealth uh, digital? They will, be. they will be. This is the collection that we're working on describing and, and I, I, I it's think, challenging because you have partial information on some, we have no information on others. I think these are just beautiful. I mean, besides industrial documentation, they are works of art. The, the black and the white uh, contrasting so well. Mm -hmm. Most photographers at the time were self-taught and, and you can actually see in his, he took a lot of winter photographs. He was really struggling with exposure and sometimes we, we actually have multiple um, uh, plates of almost the same image. You can see he was trying to get it. He was trying to play around a little bit, but, but you're right, I mean, this is, this is one of the most beautiful photographs of the, the penstock that I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, Stunning how big yeah, it is. Yeah. And else. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think I'm going to let you wrap it up here today. Okay. And, and thank you so much for taking this leisurely amount of time to show us around your archives and special collections. I think our viewers and, and uh, people on YouTube, and we'll, when we finally release this into the wall, are really going to appreciate finding out more about Holyoke history. It's fascinating. I learned so much here today. I'm really going to be happy to share this. 
Well, thank you for coming, John. And as you know, you just saw a, a smidgen mm -hmm. of, oh, of what's here. <laughs> there is a lot here. Thanks so much, Henry. All right.